right, my friends, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know some folks are still arriving, so we will watch for them. And um, just to do housekeeping issues while we're getting started, make sure to keep yourself on mute if you are not speaking. Um, we're going to go through some quick introductions of our hosts and co-hosts this evening and then um, dive right into the meat of the presentation. We are so grateful to have Angie here um, with us to give us this presentation this evening. We'll get that up. You are, we do invite you to ask questions as we go through the presentation. So um, as we get started, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us your name. Um, if you are with an organization or faith community, please let us know that as well. And then um, what city you're in tonight. Uh, I am so, so glad we are here together to have this advocacy training which is sponsored by Lama AZ. Is that how we're saying it right? Uh, the, the Lutheran Advocacy Ministry of Arizona, Bread for the World and Arizona Faith Network. And if you've not met me before, I am uh, Reverend Katie Sexton Wood. I am the Executive Director of the Arizona Faith Network. Uh, just a couple brief points about our organization. Um, we have a history dating back to 1946 where we were the Arizona Council of Churches. Um, in 1968, we were the Arizona Ecumenical Council, and in 2015, we became Arizona Faith ne Network and Interfaith Network. Um, and our vision is people of faith uniting to create positive change for the common good. And we do that through building meaningful relationships, shared prayer and dialogue that's rooted in our faith traditions and actions that influence public awareness, engagement, and policy. And that is what brings us here today, that last part, influencing public awareness, engagement, and policy. And with that, I'm going to hand uh, the mic over to my good, good friend, um, Lupe. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Lupe Conchas, and I'm the Southwest Regional Organizer for Bread for the World, um, in charge of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. And um, we are a Christian-based organization that has been writing letters to Congress on, on hunger and poverty since 1974. And here in Arizona, we are, work with our partners, such, um, such as those who are co-sponsoring this event today, um, to make sure that we're talking with our, our senators, Senator Sinema, Senator Kelly, and our um, delegation in the House of Representatives. So um, we're really excited uh, to be here with all of you and focusing on the state legislature. And we, we just um, think that all of God's children deserve di dignity, respect, and we need to end hunger and poverty. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I am Solve Moose, and I am the director of Lutheran Advocacy Ministry of Arizona. We are a ministry of the Grand Canyon Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And we are here in Arizona, we are one of 17 state public policy offices of the ELCA. Um, we are the newest office of the ELCA, um, state public policy offices. We've been around for about a year and um, we join, our mission statement is to join with the most vulnerable of our society to voice our, voice our common needs in the public square advocating our faith and love. So our goal is to um, work with our congregations to develop um, our baptismal call to love our neighbors. And uh, tonight we are, we are here um, to talk a little bit about, to help our congregations uh, understand more about how a bill becomes a law here in Arizona and what they can do to take action. I'm also here to introduce our uh, presenter for tonight. And that um, person is Angie Garen Burleson. Angie is uh, the founder and product, project director of Arizona Recovers, which is formerly Addiction Haven, uh, which is a grassroots organization dedicated to changing the conversation surrounding addiction, mental health, and trauma. And also Arizona ACE or Adverse Childhood Experiences Consortium, which promotes a greater understanding of the impact of toxic stress and trauma and supports efforts to address and prevent them. 
Um, Angie has extensive experience advocating in these areas and in social justice areas with the Arizona State Legislature. I have now known her for nearly a year. Uh, this is my third um, sort of training with her. She's wonderful. She has great spirit. Um, she's she's super casual, very engaging. I have a feeling you're really going to like um, what she has to say and how she has to say it. At the end of our presentation, we'll have uh, an opportunity to talk with you, with you a little bit more. But for now, I'd just like you to welcome, please, uh, our good friend, Angie Burleson. I thank you. Um, <clears throat> a little a little funny is what I actually was never even registered to vote um, until the 2016 election um, because I was so against politics. Politics was a big thing in our household growing up and it and it completely put it off until I started doing advocacy work um, at the state level in to late 2014 um, and realized how much impact a few people can have in getting meaningful legislation um, passed and that it really came down to just education. Um, and so while <clears throat> while I'm kind of a newbie in the political arena, we have been doing this for, well, this is our seventh year now. We actually just completed our sixth advocacy day um, today, our addiction and recovery advocacy day. We started out with um, 10 people in 2015 and, um, and we have, COVID brought our numbers down a little bit this year. Last year, we had about 150. Um, and so it's it's really exciting to, to talk about um, how we can affect change because um, what I have learned and my favorite thing is, is when people realize, oh, we're just talking to another person and this isn't as hard as I thought it was. Um, and knowing the different steps of, of what it takes, I think empowers us to be able to understand um, where we can best advocate and where our voices um, are used the best. I am a really casual presenter, so questions, please put them in the chat. They're up on my second screen, so I will see them. Um, if you have a question that I haven't seen, but it's you know pertinent, feel free to come off mute and um, interrupt me. Um, I have no I have no problem with that. So today we'll talk right first about how do, how bills become laws. Um, so we know where we can advocate and then talk about what can we do. So in Arizona, our legislative season um, is typically January to April. Um, so it always starts like the second week of January, and then the ending date is what changes. Sometimes, um, depending if it's election year or um, you know, whatever their fancy is, that you're, it might be pushed a little bit shorter, um, but it tip, uh, and it may go a little bit longer if there's a lot of things on the docket or if things like the budget hasn't passed. It's usually one of the, the last things that goes through, um, but it ends somewhere usually around April. What happens when, when they are creating a bill is you're going to have an individual legislator or a group of legislators that will draft a bill. This work gets done in the off season. So from May to December, they are meeting um, with constituents and they're learning um, about their different special interests and where they could affect some change. Um, and that's where they, they work on drafting those bills. Once they have their, you know, their interests and the ones that they want to do, they will draft the bill and then they will solicit colleague support for co-sponsors of the bill. So when we look at bills and, and I'll show you later how you can see the bills, it'll have like a prime sponsor. That's that person who drafted that bill. That was their thing. They really wanted to do it. They drafted it. And then they looked for co-sponsors because the more co-sponsors you have, obviously the more support that bill has. And so they really work in the off season and before we even start to get as much legislative support around their bill as possible to make it easier once legislation, leg, legislative season goes because it is fast paced. And that is the one thing about the season. It is fast, fast paced. All bills are introduced in the prime sponsors home chamber. And what I mean by home chamber is we have the Senate 
and we have the House of Representatives. So if you have a representative and they're the sponsor, that bill is going to be introduced in the House of Representatives first. If it's a senator's bill, then it will be introduced in the Senate first. And all bills will go through the same process in both chambers. So it's kind of that making it fair, right? We all have the exact same process in the Senate as it does in the House and vice versa. Every single year, thousands of bills are submitted, um, but only a fraction of it make it through the entire process to become law. And once you see the process, you'll understand why. Um, it's, it's pretty detailed. Um, but what we're looking at is there's usually around two, 300 new laws um, every single year. And there are 1,500 to 2,000 new bills that are actually read into the session. So it really is just kind of a fraction of it. So I will go through kind of the steps. So we have the legislators, they have their bills, um, and these are the steps in their home chamber first, right? Is that every bill is going to get a first reading and a second reading. And what that is, is it's really just being read into the session. If anybody's ever watched a session, because they're all televised, um, all of this is open to the public, it will be a poor clerk who is running through the list of the bills so incredibly fast. Um, the other day I heard her read 152 bills into session so into their second read 152 and she just i don't even know how she did it she must she was holding her breath the whole entire time and all of a sudden she would stop and take a deep breath and then keep continuing going it kind of sounds like an auction house um but every bill will have that first and second reading the senate president and the speaker of the house they are just they decide um whether a bill is read into session or not at the second here, or second reading, the Senate president or the Speaker of the House, both of them um, in their respective chamber, they decide what committees that bill is going to be heard in. So um, what happens in the committee hearings, this is where it is like your time that you can actively participate and have your voice um, be heard in a, in a larger way. Um, is they will assign a bill to whatever the respective committees there are. Um, so if it's an education bill, it will typically go into the education committee, health and human services, judicial, those different committees. And those committees will then decide if they will. So because it gets assigned into a committee doesn't actually mean it's going to get heard. That is up to the committee chair. And um, when that committee chair decides that they wanna hear that bill in that committee, that's when, they will that's when they'll put it on the agenda and that's where you can come in to um, have your voice be heard. Um, we'll go through how we can do that later on, but this is, this is that one step. The only committee that you cannot be, um, that you can't, speak at is the rules committee. So every single bill is going to be assigned to at least a minimum of two committees. And that's gonna be a committee that it pertains to and the rules committee. And the rules committee is just, is this bill legal? Is this bill proper for consideration? Um, or is there legalities that um, they need to look at? And so that's what the rules committee is. It's just a formal um, process that they go through that says, yes, this bill is proper for consideration. You can go ahead um, through the rest of the process. Is there any questions about drafting that bill or the first reading, second reading or the committees? Okay, so um, we've had our bills, they've been read in discussion, they have gone into committees, they have passed their committees, they are now going into the caucuses. Um, these, they have the Democratic caucus and they have the Republican caucus, right? This is where those caucuses um, read the bill, look the bill over, they debate the bill, they debate the pros and cons, and then they decide what position the caucus will take on the bill. That's where they decide when the caucus will take on the bill. Lawmakers, however, can vote 
their conscience. So they can vote whatever they would like. Even if the Republicans decide that they don't support that bill or the Democrats decide that they don't support that bill, that doesn't mean that all Democrats have to vote that way. It just means that as the caucus, that is what, that is what they've decided. After it has gone to caucuses, it is going to go to third reading um, or what you'll see in the bill status where another portion of this is the committee of the whole. It will show up as COW, COW. Um, that's just the committee of the whole. That is once it has gone through all of those processes, then the entire body of that chamber, whether it's the Senate or the House of Rep Representatives, they actually debate that bill in the committee of the whole. So it is, um, it is, they read the bill into the session and then you have everyone getting up and um, speaking their mind on that bill before they decide to go for a final vote in that house. Um, once it goes through the committee of the whole and they've all debated it, then they will have that vote for it. Um, and, and then if it passes, it will cross the courtyard. So what that means is, like I said at the beginning, everything goes through both chambers, both the Senate and the House. If it started in the Senate and it passes the Senate, then it crosses the courtyard and goes to the House and repeats that whole process all over again. And if it starts in the House, then it'll go to the Senate and repeat the whole process again. It's a long process, but it's a great process because it allows many, many touch points um, for us as community members to have our voice heard. Um, it also allows for uh, better legislation to get pushed through. Um, it, during all of these points, um, there's abilities for amendments and things. Um, legislators are people, they're humans, just like you and I. Um, they have really great ideas. They do as much research as they can when they're drafting the bill but that doesn't mean that they understand how that bill affects all different populations, right? And so it, it may look like a really good bill at the beginning. And then you look at it and you realize, ooh, this in a, inadvertently affects another population in a negative way. And if we change a little bit of this bill, we can make it so it doesn't affect that, right? And so that process allows for that to happen um, throughout it. The conference committee um, is if there is, say we added a few amendments, um, it passed the house, it passed the house, and in the Senate we added a few amendments to it. And the house doesn't agree with those amendments. Then they can go to um, a conference committee and kind of hash out their differences and because both chambers have to agree on the exact same bill. Does that make sense? So if we, have, if we didn't change it in the House, but we change it in the Senate, then we definitely have to go back to the House and say, hey, I know you passed this version. We really like this version better. Um, can we pass this one instead? And if they say yes, you know, they go through the vote and they're yes, then it's all good and it goes on to the next steps. But if they're like, uh, yeah, I don't like your amendments, I don't like your changes, um, let's discuss it. That's where it goes to that kind of conference committee. Not a lot of bills go into conference committee. Um, there is so much work that is done outside of the actual, you know, meetings and third readings and things like that, that typically all of those kinks have been worked out throughout that whole entire process. But it still does happen at times. And if you're watching a bill on the request to speak system and it says that it's in conference committee, I just like to have you understand what that is um, because it is a really great, um, it's a really great advocacy position to talk to the majority whip or the minority whip um, of, the, of those caucuses um, because they have a lot of say during those places. So a lot of steps. Then we have the final vote, right? So now we've all agreed 
with everything. We all have the same thing. We go into the vinyl vote and it goes to the governor. The governor then has five days to sign the bill into law, veto it or do nothing and just allow it to become law without his, his or her signature. So what that does is say the governor, um, maybe it's not, maybe it's not something they really support, but it's something that has enough support from the legislature. It has enough support from the public that um, there are, there's enough pressure to have this go through, but he doesn't want to put his stamp of approval, so to say on it, right? His or her stamp of approval. Then he can, then they can just let the bill go into law effectively without actually taking action on it. Um, the reason they have 10 days after legislature has adjourned is because the last about week of session, but especially the last few days of session, they will have easily 30, 40 bills that um, are being approved on the last days. So the governor, instead of having, you know, five bills approved this week or six bills approved this day, he's now, he or she is now getting a group of bills, like 80 to 100 bills. And so it gives them a little bit more time to kind of look through it. Um, but those are all of the different steps um, to it. And I have it all in kind of one bigger piece to it. Are there any questions about how this all happens? There's a couple in the chat. Sherry said, how responsive, thank you. How responsive are committee chairs to public input on hearing or not hearing a bill? Um, that depends on how many of the public they are hearing from, um, which is why we, you know, why we always try to gather as many, like, please, if you could send your email, call, do whatever our action step is um, to the committee chair, because the more, um, the more understanding and education that they have on the bill, um, the more support is shown for that bill, the better chance you have of, um, of, hearing, of hearing that bill. And I mean, I have seen things honestly in committees where we have gone into the committee, the committee was going to vote no on it. We knew they were going to vote no on it. Um, we knew that there was, um, that it that actually wasn't going to pass. And we have had one person get up and tell their story and change the dynamic of the entire committee and it has passed. And I've, I've watched that happen a few times now um, in the process. And so never discount um, what your story or what your you know, contact um, can actually do to get a bill moving because you never you never know what it's going to be right we're, we're human um, and how many of us have heard the same story story right like has happened to other people numerous times and then all of a sudden we meet that one person that has that same story that we've heard about but it just hits us a little bit different way and we're like oh I I never thought of it that way. And we, we finally have that emotional connection, right? That's how they are. There's, they're humans. Um, they've, I know that there's been a lot of, what's the word? Um, oh, I can't think of the word that's, yeah. I know there's been a lot of contention, let's say contention, um, in the past couple of years when it has come to our political arena. Um, and it feels like, and it can feel like, um, our legislatures are just doing whatever they want to do. But our legislators all chose to become um, public servants. That may have gotten jaded across the years, it doesn't discount the fact of why they got into 
um, the legislature and, and why they are why they are doing this service. They they are um, representatives for their communities, um, and the majority of the vast, 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 vast majority of them. Um, in fact, after the seven years that I've been doing this, I've had one representative that has refused to meet with any of his constituents, and that was just this year. So there are 90 um, legislatures, uh, legislators in the state of Arizona, and I have had one in seven years that refuse. They all want to meet their constituents and learn about whatever that project is doing. Um, does the rules committee review amendments? When do strikers happen and how is one of the, one of the um, questions, which is a great, um, which is a great question. One, um, does the rules committee review amendments? Yes. Um, the amendments are put on in the committee hearings. So um, that's where they're going to be voted on. Um, sometimes the amendments are put on in like the cow, um, the committee of the whole section. Um, those, those are reviewed though when they go through that next step. Does that make sense? Because they have to go through the rules committee in, in both sides. Um, so yes, they do, they do review the amendments. When do strikers happen and how? So strikers are actually, I think a really cool thing because they've done really great things for what we have wanted them to do. But the legislature all runs on a schedule. So um, for example, this week is cross the courtyard week, which means any bill that was introduced in the house has to have completed the process in the house and it has, has to cross the courtyard to the Senate in order for it to stay active in session and vice versa. If there's a bill right now, and I can tell you there's hundreds of them that have had a, a hearing in the house, but they haven't been voted through, if they don't get voted on this week and go to the Senate, they will die and we'll have to bring them back next year. Um, or if you have some legislative support, you um, might be able to get that bill that died in session in the House put on as a striker to another bill in the other chamber. So um, say I'm following this bill and we'll use syringe services because that's, that's the bill that we're advocating for um, this year. If um, the syringe service bill died in the, in the Senate where it started, then a House of Representatives could um, take bill, remove the language of that bill, add the other bill to it, and it goes through that process. And it's, it seems, it, it is kind of like switching one out for another, um, but, it, but it does happen. That bill will still have to go through both, both chambers though, regardless. Um, because it has been changed. Um, that is also where that conference committee will come in because the original bill that was voted through in that, you know, like in the house um, has now completely changed. And so they're gonna have to get it reviewed. Does that make sense about the striker? The striker is always a little um, shaky. Yeah, Okay, so the cool thing is um, with as long as all of this is, if you can see my cursor, is that there's lots of different action points that you can take. Um, whether it is getting your bill read in session, if that is the case, like um, for example, your bill has passed the House and now it's waiting to be read into the Senate, but it's been weeks and it hasn't been read in yet then you can contact the Senate president and urge support for reading that bill in this session and giving it a chance to go through that session piece. Once, once it is in committee, um, on the website, you can see all of the different committees. You can see who the chair is, who participates on that committee, and you have the ability to target those people that, um, that are on that committee. Um, so you'll see this bill was assigned to education. 
um, and then you can know who to target, right? This is also where you can use request to speak or you can go down to the Capitol and have um, your voice heard um, in person, um, preferably not during COVID time, um, which is why we have really cool things in Arizona to help us with that. Um, when it is in the third reading or the committee of the whole, that's where you'd be reaching out to your own personal legislators or the whole body in itself. And um, you can feel free to email um, and call any of them that you want. The more understanding that we have, the better. Um, and so then those are the different action points that we have in, in kind of each place. Are there any questions on this before we move forward of how to? Okay. All right. Okay, so what can we do? This is the cool part. Um, educate our legislators, right? Like I said, we're all human. We only know what we know. Um, and, and so it is, it is really up to us to have that education and doing that through email, phone calls, speaking, speaking in the committee hearings. And then the coolest thing that the state of Arizona has is the request to speak system. Um, this is a system that we can use at home. Um, the first time you access this system, and I believe that Solveig is, is good, is still doing the signups um, that you have to, the first time you have to activate it at the Capitol. And so, um, but once it's activated at the Capitol, you can use it at home. And the request to speak system allows you to have your voice be heard. It allows you to put your position on the bills. It um, also allows you to track it so you can see where it is in session. Um, this is the apps, it's apps.azleg.gov or you can go to azleg.gov and it'll say right on one of the bars, it'll say request to speak and you can click on it. Um, there's a little sign on in the top and then you can have either one of the two options there of that request to speak or bill inquiry. This is if this is in committee. So say that um, Reverend Sexton or you know Solveig or Lupe emails you and says, this bill is in committee please go show your support for it. This is how you would do that. You would sign into your account, you would go to request to speak and you'd click new request. And this will pop up. You will enter the bill number in this search phrase and it will bring you to this section, right? These bills are blue and they're hyperlinked. So if you wanted more information on what the bill was, you could click on that and it will take you to the explanation page. And then you click add your re add request. Once you add your request, and this option, unless you're a registered lobbyist, is not gonna show up on your page, so you can ignore that. This is what will show up on your page right here. Um, that is where you can put where your position on the item is. So you can put that you're for it, that you're neutral, or that you're against it. Um, and then you can write your comments. And this is just as if you spoke in the committee hearing itself. Um, when, you, when they're asked on do you wish to speak, if you are doing this from home, and you are not gonna be in the committee hearing in person, you're gonna say no. That do you wish to speak is solely if you're there in person. Um, you will click no, but you will write this comment. And this is the cool thing. These comments follow that bill throughout the whole entire process. And so every legislator that goes on can see what your comment was. So they, they gave you information of what bill you're supporting, what committee it's in. You go in, you put that you're for it, you put that you don't want to speak, and then you add your comment and you say, I'm in support of this because, or please pass this, please vote yes, you know, whatever your comment is. Um, and it allows you to, to have your voice go on record in that committee hearing that you either supported it, you were against it, or um, you were neutral. Some people say, why would I put neutral? And that is saying, you know what? This bill has some really positive things, but there are some negative things to it. You can put the negative things to it in the comment. 
And um, you can always change your position on the bill if they change it, right? It's that ability to, um, to have your voice heard. Um, another great thing about this is if you have lost your right to vote in the state of Arizona, you can still utilize the request to speak system. So you do not have to be a registered voter in order to have your, your voice be heard, which is, um, which is really cool. This is one that we all want you to do regardless, <laughs> whether it's in committee or whether it's not, we want you to add your name onto the bill that says, I support this bill. Um, what that does is in, when we, sh when we show you the bill status inquiry place, you can actually see, it will list everybody's name that signed on in support of the bill or everybody's name who signed on against the bill. Um, and that's really great because it gives the legislators a great visual to see all of the names listed that were either for it or against it. So that way they can see how much public support there is for that. That in itself is public pressure and is really, 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 really good. And it's probably the superest, easiest thing you could do. So for that one, you log on to the request to speak system and instead of new requests, you click my bill positions. And then you put the bill number in here and then, and click on it. So you'll put the bill number and it'll come up with a little box of the full title of it. You click on it and then you can add your position here and click add. And it, this is what yours will show up. This, um, this was actually mine from earlier. So you can see what that looks like. At any time you can update your position. So say they changed the languaging of this bill. And all of a sudden I was like, I can't support that in any way, shape or form. You can go to update and you can change to against. So does anybody have questions on those two pieces? Cause those are the really, those are the probably the most important things that we do is adding our position on a bill. Are there only 250 characters allowed in the comments? There are only 250 characters allowed in the comments for when it's in committee hearing, yes. Yeah. A little bit restrictive. It is a little restrictive, yeah. It is a little restrictive. Hmm. But when so you can make you that can focus. You, oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. So, can you do uh, a Zoom? Can you actually talk to the committee on Zoom these days? So right now they do have ability because all committee hearing all committee hearings are open to the public. So you can either go down to the Capitol in person or you can be heard um, on um, on Zoom, and um, and all of that information is um, in the committee when you click on the committee to see what room they're in you can actually find that information but they're all open to the public right now yeah and that is where you can go down and stand up in front of them and um and give them the com give them your personal comments and they can't limit you to 250 characters they do a lot of times limit you to two to five minutes though uh, I, I, you may have given us the website for the committee meeting times. And have you done that? Or um, are you going to do that later? I'll show you that later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, there's a question. Do you do both request and bill positions? Yes. Yes. So the bill position will stay. That is your, you, it's kind of you signing on to a bill. Like if you've, you've never done a sign on letter, that's you signing on to the bill. Um, the new request is when it's in a committee hearing and you want that committee, which is in, pertinent for it to continue on in the session. You want that committee to hear your personal um, opinion. And plus it just shows that there's people that are committed to following this bill and watching it go through process, which is really important, which is really important. Um, another piece of this um, system is that you can get bill status. And that's, called, that's the bill status inquiry. 
that's this button right here. It allows you to follow that bill's progress. It allows you to read the entire bill. You can read all of the amendments. You can see how your legislator voted. You can see how all the legislators voted. Um, and you can actually watch it through every step. So I had to minimize this quite a bit to show you what it kind of looks like. So the, the writing is really small, um, but I'm gonna point some things out. So all bills will have this overview and this overview will go through where it stands and what it does. So this is, um, it was first read into session on January 11th. It was assigned to these committees right here. This is the committees that it was assigned to. Um, once it goes through those committees, it'll tell you. So DPA is um, due pass. Um, PFC is proper for consideration. And then it'll show you all the votes. Um, this is their show the Senate third. These are the different votes that it had. So this vote after they added amendments to it, then it passed um, fully through the Senate. So there was, there was no dissenting votes that it was 30 eyes. Um, you can also see any of the videos that have been attached to it from the committee hearings. You can see the sponsor and the keywords for it. You can see the RTS current bill positions. That's what I was talking about when you sign up. When you click on that, you can see everybody who's signed in for or against the bill. And then the documents place takes you to the actual meat of the bill. So you get to read the bill. All of the amendments are posted there, all of, all of the agendas. So that is the RTS system in a very short, succinct nutshell. <laughs> Do we have questions? on the RTL system, because it, it really is one of the, um, it's one of our greatest tools that we have. I actually don't know another state that has a tool like this that allows um, for such easy um, public um, advocacy and, um, and really kind of transparency. So you always know where that bill is. So can you say what those um, uh, the abbreviations are under the action again? So the in the act, and the yeah. So this this is like this is like due pass. So um, it it has it has passed that committee, um, and then you can see the vote. I had, to move, I had to move our faces. So then you can see our vote um, all the way on the right that says like it was eight to zero. So that just means that it passed. C just means proper for consideration. Um, the A's mean that it probably had amendments. So do pass as amended and proper for consideration as amended is what is what those specific ones. Typically it just says the DP or the PFC. Thank you. You're welcome. Where are we at? Oh, we're already at 15 minutes left. Okay. So um, how can we, um, how can we communicate with them, right? Email, phone call, individual meeting, important pieces. Find out who your legislators are. This is your email. And if somebody wants to type it into the chat, um, is azredistricting.org slash uh, district locator. That will show you um, when you put your address in, it will give you your district. You wanna pay attention to the legislative district. That's your state district. This congressional district is your federal district. So your state district is what you, um, what you need to find out in order to find out who your legislators are. Um, Rich, I'll answer that in one second. Then you go to the Arizona Legislator website, right? It's azleg.gov. Um, and that's where you can find your members. Um, Abe, this is also where you would find um, the committees, who's on your committees. That is, um, that is right here. Um, 
the question there's when you go down to the Capitol to sign up, do you just go to the front desk and tell them you want to sign up for RTS? No, they are, there are two, there are th uh, two or three computers in the Senate's chambers and two or three computers in the House. And um, those computers are what you log on to and you'll always see it. There's almost always people standing in front of them. And they're right when you first walk in, you log in on those computers. You can create your account um, or um, you can just sign into your account for the first time. That is what Solveig does when she goes down to the Capitol is you sign up on her little sheet. Um, she takes your email. She's gonna go down to the Capitol for you. She's gonna start your account for you. She's gonna email you and say, here is your account is active. Here is your password. And then you, you'll be able to access your account from home. When you go into the member list, it's gonna show up like this. Um, this is really an Excel sheet. And so you can click on district and it'll sort the district from one to 30. So that way you can easily find your district. That is gonna be their name, what party they're in. Their email is always their first initial last name at azleg.gov, what room they're in and their phone number. These um, are important. These are their titles, their majority wit, minority leader. You can see what position they hold um, in their chamber. Is there a question? Yeah, I just ha had a question. So could you repeat uh, the first time you go, go to sign up, is that, is that you have to do that to sign up for RTS or for the in-person questions? That's so that you have to sign up for RTS. Yeah, so you have, you to, have to go to over to in person, right? You, yes, um, Solveig does it in person for you and also civic engagement beyond voting will register you also. So there are organizations that will register you the first time at the Capitol so you can access the system at home. If you're going to speak in a committee in person, you actually have to be registered on that system so that way you can sign up. That was where, um, where you'd go to add your comments if you were gonna, if you wanted to speak in person, you would click yes, I want to speak, and that you would do once you got down to the Capitol on those computers. Does that make sense? Yes. How do we contact um, uh, the, the lady uh, Sol Solveig? Like, how do we do? We have to do make an appointment with her. I think she put it in the chat. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. Oh no, it's okay. Um, she said, email llama at director at oh, okay. llama. That's, that's so okay. Yep. I got that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I love these questions. That just means you're going to be active and that's amazing to me. So um, some communication tips when you're meeting with your legislators, uh, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person, educate yourself on the bill. And the most important thing, understand their point of view. Remember, we're all humans and we all react and only know what we know, period, end of story. And we all have our own story that goes with um, however we're feeling at the point. Their point of view is just as valid as yours. It may not be the same, that's great, um, but it's still as valid. And when we understand why they're coming or what their point of view is, it helps us to tailor what we want to advocate for, right? We then um, understand how we can make the most um, impact in a way that they can hear it. Um, and so instead of us just speaking at them, we're actually having a conversation with them. Highlight the key points. Um, they don't have a lot of time. You're typically gonna get 10 to 15 minutes. Um, if we're lucky later in the session, you're looking at about five to 10. Um, find statistics that are important to the legislator. Always be polite, right? Always, be, you should always be polite anyway, but, um, and sharing your personal story. Um, that emotional connection, we know as humans, we only do what we're emotionally connected to. It's just how we function as humans. And that's why your personal story is so important because it takes those statistics off the paper and it puts them in front of them um, as a person. When you're making those appointments, be nice to the staffer. They are literally the gatekeepers of everything. <laughs> they um, make sure that everything runs on time. Um, they will help fit you in. 
if there is time, uh, the nicer you are to them, the nicer they are to you. Um, always leave your name and contact information and let them know that you are a constituent. There are some legislators that will only meet with constituents later in the season. Um, they tend to only have time to meet with constituents in person or virtually. Um, and so those are, those are things that are really important to, um, to have them know. When you're meeting with them, dress business casual. The great thing about Zoom is you only have to do it from the top up these days. Um, but either way, dress business casual. Bring or email them materials. So if you have extra information on the bills that you're supporting and why, you want to make sure that you're going to leave it with them. Because remember, we have five to 15 minutes tops to tell them our personal story. And then we have that ability to leave them with the materials so that way when they have more time, they can look through them. Um, if you own a business, let them know, bring your business cards um, and always be concise and respectful of their time. Not like me who has gone over and now we're rushing through. Um, but just kind of keep it, you know, um, as concise as possible. It also allows time for them to, um, to ask questions if they want. Now, before I wrap this up with just a samples of um, the follow-ups, do we have any questions on, um, on anything so far? So on the RTS or on making appointments, meeting with them. Yeah, I got a question. So okay. you, said, you said between May and December, they write their bills. Um, how do you contact them, you know, if you have some kind of concerns or you would same like way. to get your, pardon? It's the, you contact them the same way. So they, they, their staffers are still working. Um, you contact them through the same phone numbers and the same emails. Okay, you contact request them, okay. appointments. Yep. Request appointments with them. Um, they, they meet year round. They meet with people year so round. So can you request appointments on the uh, RTS or just do it personally? Or something? Do you do, you request their appointments personally. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so after you've had your successful meeting with them where you've shared your personal story and you've had a really great connection and, and you felt like they, they really heard you, you always want to follow up with a thank you. Um, one, it keeps your, um, keeps it in their purview, right? And two, it allows you to add a little bit more detail um, and important things that they're going to um, remember. Easy peasy to make an appointment. You call them and say, hi, my name is, and I'm a constituent and I would like to meet with the senator or representative. Um, would she be, would they have time available to meet with me? and you set up an appointment, right? You can tell them what bills you are looking for, um, either what bills you're advocating for, and, um, and then they set the appointment up for you. With COVID, they've been doing them virtually over Zoom. Um, they've been doing phone calls, and um, some legislators will do in-person um, meetings. Um, some of them will only do in-person meetings right now. If there is a time where um, they're saying, hey, we really need some public support for this. Um, can you help move it forward? And they're asking you to email. Um, this is kind of how you, how you do it, right? You say, dear whoever you're writing to, you write one or two sentences at the top. This is the bill that I'm supporting. This is why this bill is important. Um, a couple more like, supporting points, whether they're statistics that, um, that are important or what's going on, a little bit of your personal story, and then of course, thanking them. Um, and really just um, making it as short as possible. They're not gonna um, read a lot. You know what I mean? All of that time. Important pieces, right? You are the change. We really are, we really are. <laughs> it only, it really just takes a committed, um, a few, and it is really amazing what can actually be done. Um, the first bill that we passed, I can tell you, um, was at the very end, they were holding it back and it, it was not, it didn't look like it was going to pass. It was the last day of session. 
And, um, and that bill had two people, me and another person that were supporting that bill throughout the whole entire process. Um, and about 20 really angry moms. Um, and, and that is what, that's what got that bill passed. And that bill has, has saved hundreds of thousands of lives. And that's actually the honest truth. It was our naloxone, um, bill, um, which is an overdose reversal drug. Um, and, and that was done by a very few amount of people. And so um, it, we really do have the ability to do things. So think of two things that you're willing to commit to. And if you don't know what they are, um, Lupe Solveig and Reverend Katie are going to um, give you a couple ideas. Um, email and thank your legislators for your service, follow local elections and really vote really vote. It is, it's kind of up to you. Um, are there any questions before we go into action steps? Okay. Solve. Well, on behalf of, of Arizona Faith Network and Bread for the World and Lama, we want to thank share, We want to thank so much Angie Burleson for her presentation. It was marvelous as always. I promise you it would be, and it was. Um, there's a lot to know here, a lot to um, learn and understand. But I think one of the things that you probably learned, especially, is it's truly easy. It's truly easy to do and it's truly impactful if you do it. So um, we just wanted to have a quick opportunity to tell you about a couple of things that we're watching. Um, I particularly am watching um, uh, bill, num bill number SB 1485. Um, SB 1485 renames the permanent early voting list as the early voting list. So instead of PEVL, it's EVL, and it removes a voter from the EVL if the voter fails to vote by early ballot in both the primary election and the general election for two consecutive primary and general elections, right? Um, it's, the view is, the, the bill is viewed by Lama as essentially, I guess, uh, voter suppression. Um, you might recall that Senator Boyer voted against party uh, and killed a similar bill two weeks ago. And then the bill wasn't expected to move because it didn't have the votes. But now the same concept with a different bill number has been introduced. Um, it was on the floor calendar for today, but it was retained uh, because Senator Gowan is ill with COVID. So it's expected to be on the floor tomorrow. Now, um, I think you can imagine that that um, if you're on, if you've signed up to be on the early voting list and you miss two elections, you would really not want to have to redo your whole sign up again. So um, that's the bill that I happen to be watching. Um, we want to make sure that Ashley from um, Arizona Food Bank Networks has a chance to tell you about her bill. Ashley, you there? Oh yeah, thanks. I appreciate you advancing those slides. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Ashley St. Thomas. I'm the public policy manager at the Arizona Food Bank Network. Really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. And this was such a great presentation. Thank you, Angie. Um, just briefly, and, and these slides I think will be shared. So you'll have all of these links. Um, just really briefly, we are a coalition of five regional food banks, which doesn't mean regional in the traditional sense, it's just they're the large food banks in the state. Um, think of them sort of like warehouses like Costco's. Um, and they get food to about a thousand food pantries. And obviously I think a lot of you are familiar with those. A lot of them are houses of worship um, that directly um, distribute food to folks in need. And so uh, we work with them on transportation and distribution of that food, but also on policy with the statewide anti-hunger advocacy network. So this bill is one that um, we are championing. Senator Kerr is the sponsor from District 13. She's in Yuma and, oops, just the lights went out in my room, apologies. <laughs> 
Um, so what the bill does is it would provide an additional $1 million in annual ongoing funding for the line item in DES's budget. <laughs> They're not in Texas? They're not in Texas. No, I'm actually here in Arizona. There might be, you know, a spiritual presence in the room I'm not aware of, but I um, appreciate you bearing with me. So that line item in DES's budget um, supports, <laughs> helps support our food bank operations. So I have a link here to the fact sheet on the bill and it passed out of the Senate um, on a 27-3 vote. There's the board. Um, there were three nay votes, and I think those are primarily because they want to see that funding come from COVID resources. But we know that even prior to the pandemic, the, um, the need for food and the demand at our food banks had increased by almost 50% over the past 15 years, but the state funding has remained the same. And we work in partnership with the state and the governor's office, and really, um, we know that they support emergency food assistance, and our, our food banks do a lot more than that, obviously. They they have a lot of training programs and um, work with school meals and all sorts of different ways to get um, folks the food they need. So um, this is crossover week, as Angie mentioned, and so our bill moved to the house. And today uh, it was double assigned, which means it's gonna have to be heard in two different committees before it can move forward. So that's House Health and Human Services and Appropriations, because obviously it is an appropriations bill. So there are, you know, you can use all of the things you just learned from Angie to um, sign on in support of this bill. Uh, you can look at our fact sheet and see more about what the food banks would do with these resources. And I'm happy to answer any questions or connect you with um, your, your legislator if you're interested in, in meeting with them. Sorry about <laughs> Sorry about the technical difficulties. No, that's, that's Zoom in our virtual world. It's, it's totally, completely fine and great. Um, I, for one, am thankful for you all as our organization does homeless outreach. Um, and we do use our food bank for, um, for all of our services and the amount that we're able to get out um, is, is really great. I know that there's a question, um, but um, Lupe, did you have um, something? And then um, Reverend Sexton, did you have um, something else that you wanted? Yes, um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to mention um, that Bread for the World in Arizona um, is working closely with our um, hunger partners here on this call. And so we are in strong support of this bill 1369. And what we do with Bread for the World is we try to encourage our faith partners, our churches, our pastors um, to uh, hold ho virtual house meetings, to um, do a little bit of community organizing. And we also um, are really good at doing storytelling, storytelling training. So um, if I was to speak to my representatives, I would tell them a little bit about my personal story and growing up in childhood, childhood hunger and childhood poverty and not really knowing where my next meal would come from. For me, I know that the food bank is a place where we really had to rely on when we didn't have any, any food. Um, and I remember uh, as a kid, my favorite meal was sardines, crackers, and grape soda because it only cost $1.50. Um, and so uh, Bread for the World would love to partner with your church or your organization to do more advocacy trainings like this. Um, we do uh, state uh, um, advocacy, but we also do federal advocacy. Um, and so I invite you uh, to join our, our webinar on, February, on March 12th at noon, which is a Friday. Um, and we'll be talking about the right to food and how that connects with statewide and federal issues um, surrounding hunger and poverty. And I'll leave that link in the chat. Thank you, Reverend Sexton. Thank you, Lupe. I just want to say really quick, um, Arizona Faith Network is tracking a um, handful of bills and always working in partnership with our partners on this call as well to help advocate for theirs. I dropped a link in the chat to our Faithful AZ Voter website. That website has just a ton of resources um, from interfaith perspectives on why it's important to vote, to registering to vote, to linking back to um, Solvay's website to get signed up for the right to speak system. 
um, to the bills that we're tracking as well. So um, we will post this uh, recording there as well. Um, you can also find it um, on our Facebook page and um, we will send out the link of this recording to you as well. So you can reuse it with your faith communities if you want to share it with your spouse, uh, kind of nudge your, your family members to get involved and, and or rewatch it to, to kind of go back over a part that you needed a refresher on. So um, we have a lot of criminal justice stuff we are tracking. There's one bill in particular I wanted to draw your attention to, um, which is the HB 2261 on feminine hygiene products, just making sure our prisoners um, actually have the products that they need um, during all of their time in there, um, as well as many, many others. Um, one of our staffers, Ellie, is on with us who works on criminal justice reform. Um, so if you want to connect with us, please do. We have a, a commission meeting for our justice work this Thursday, and I'll drop my email in the chat for that as well. Awesome. Well, I know that we kept you um, six minutes longer. <laughs> than promised. Um, one of ours is SB 1250. If you're looking up that, that is our syringe services um, services bill. And I mean, we all know that COVID has, um, has just increased and really highlighted our gaps in services. And that's really all it has. It's not that COVID created all of a sudden these new um, things that we need assistance with. We've always had this and it has been getting worse over the last couple of decades. And COVID has really just kind of put that um, spotlight on it. Um, and so I'm really glad that we're getting that information out of how we can really affect change um, and, um, and keep an eye on what is actually going on. Um, it is, it's a level of transparency that I think that is needed. And the more people that watch and advocate, um, the more transparent they have to be. Angie, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and I know, Solve, do you have any closing words you wanted to share? I don't. I am so happy to see you all uh, joining us. So happy to see you all getting active. You know, spread the word, friends. Now's the time. Lupe, anything you want to share before we close? No, I just want to say thank you, everybody, um, very much. And, um, you know, in terms of our faith, uh, we are called to advocate. So let's do it. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. So we're going to end tonight with what we call the Quaker clap for Angie and all of our thank yous to you from afar for this great information session. And um, again, email us if you have any questions, but you will get this link to the recording sent to you via your registration email tonight. Have a great night. Thank you, thank you for having thank me. Very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good night. Namaste, Thank everybody.